Good morning. Thank you. There's one participant in the back there said good morning. That's all we need. We'll start from that. You guys look pretty this morning. There's a lot of pretty people here. Clint's here too. Let's stand up together. We're going to worship. We're going to sing because of your love. As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing, but you've come to give you all you've done because of your love. We're forgiven because of your love. Our hearts are clean. We lift you up the songs of freedom. Because of your love. As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you pour out so freely from above. Lift 
lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so well made. But we come to give you thanks for all you've done because of your love. We're forgiven. Lift you up the song of freedom forever will change because of your love. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are free. We lift you up, songs of freedom, forever we're changed, because of your love. Amen. You look good this morning, too. Did I tell you that? You sound good. I'm going to do a song now that's actually based on an old chorus from uh, it's, it's going to go back to probably the 70s when this chorus was out. Pastor Dave was probably only you know, 40 or 50 back then. And uh, it's a very simple chorus. It just says, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. And back uh, when I was touring with a contemporary Christian music group, we... Uh, we toured in South Korea for five weeks, and we performed in churches and uh, 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 schools and uh, American military bases, South Korean military bases. And at one time in the south of South Korea, we were at the uh, South Korean Naval Academy, is their uh, equivalent of, of our Annapolis there, and we did a concert there. And after that was over, a young cadet came running up to me as I was walking toward our bus, and he he just a huge grin on his face and he and he ran up to me and he grabbed one of my hands in both of his hands and he held it up to his chest and you could see he was starting to to kind of think about how he was going to do this in english and he started singing that chorus god is so good and he sang that whole chorus just and the look on his face was just amazing the passion with which he was singing that simple chorus and suddenly you realize the impact that music can have and that, that simple phrase, God is so good, he's so good to me. What a testimony that is. And this young man, he took it to heart and he sang that as his testimony. And I thought, can you imagine if we would all sing what we sing when we sing to the Lord with that kind of passion? that even such a simple chorus, God is so good, could come through in our, in our face and in our voices. He's so good to me. That's a testimony. Let's sing that testimony this morning. Amazing love that welcomes me Kindness and mercy Then bought with blood Wholeheartedly My soul undeserving God, you're so good God, you're so Yes. 
my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior that cursed Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The interim seal, a heavy storm, Messiah stood, and all alone. Oh,
of God, the Son of Heaven, rose again, oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise the again. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For in the days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. question for you to think about. So what did God do for you last week? See, sometimes we don't stop and think while the week's going on how God is acting in our lives at the moment. You know, if he has protected you from something, if he has helped you with something, if he's answered a short little prayer you said to help you with something, we tend to miss that because we don't have the mindset of looking for it you know we think we can come to church on sunday this morning like we are now and, and that's our worship time but the point is we are preparing for this time all week long by paying attention to what god's doing in our lives you know what has he done and so we need this mindset to always remember that god has promised he's always with us he has this Holy Spirit he's given to us to be with us, to guide us, direct us, comfort us, help us with prayers, do all, probably a hundred different things. But we need to stop and pay attention to what he's doing instead of getting busy with all things around us. And it makes a big difference when we get here on Sunday. You know, do we sing out the songs with joy, with praise, realizing what God's done for us? Are we ready to hear what God has to say through the word? Are we prepared to realize that we are giving our tithes and offerings. We're giving it to God instead of being focused on the money we need to do with this week, the bills we paid and stuff, but realizing, you know, God has supplied us everything we have and everything we need, and he deserves our praise, our honor, our, the glory we have to give to him, and all that because of what he's done throughout the week. So I want you to try to think more about paying attention to what God's doing each and every day in your life. So when you get here on Sundays, you're all pumped up, like George gets sometimes. Woo! There, say like that. Pumped out, like the songs we've been singing this morning, to just sing out the praise, God's so good to me. That's what it's about. God's so good to me, because you paid attention to what it is. And if there's nothing else, we always have the realization, Jesus Christ, 
the sacrifice for our sins. And how do you think about that through the week? Anybody here that didn't sin or screw up this week? Bill? I find that hard to believe. <laughs> I'll talk to Judy about that. Okay. But, yeah, we do through the week and stop and realizing, oh, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for that. You know, that realization right there should give us the greatest reason to be here to praise God on Sunday morning and, and give him what he deserves, our time, all that we are. So let's be praying this morning. Heavenly Father, we have come here this morning to worship you, to praise you, to give you honor, glory, to thank you, to recognize who you are, recognize what you've done for us. And I just ask you to help us through the week to pay attention to what you are doing for us, that our worship happens all week long, and when we get here, we get to do it together, to share what you've done for us. And so we just want to thank you for everything that you've given us, your son, our daily needs our life. All in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Glad to have you here. Those watching online, thanks for joining us here this morning as well. Before I dive into it, just want to remind you right after second service, if you forgot, or if you're sitting there and you didn't know and you're thinking, gosh, where do we want to go eat? What do we want to do? What should we have for lunch? The youth have you covered. They have their nacho bar fundraiser going on today. So I don't know if you can smell some of that meat that's being cooking and everything back there. So right when we get done here, you're invited to go back in uh, to our multi-purpose room there and just uh, enjoy some of that wonderful food that they have been uh, cooking up and have planned for you uh, that's going on back there. But let me ask you this question as we get started here today. Just a real simple question, okay? Can you see him? Now, what I mean by that is this. Can you see the way that God directs your life one decision at a time? And, 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 and he does direct you one decision at a time, but it can be difficult sometimes because, man, life is full of a lot of decisions, amen? I mean, it just seems like you wake up and, I mean, from the beginning, I mean, there's big decisions, like as you're growing up and everything, you know, uh, should I go to college? If I go to college, where should I go to college? What should I study when I'm at college? And, and, and then once you graduate college, do I, do I get a job right away that just gives me money? Do I wait? And, you know, I mean, all these things. And then if you're dating someone, been dating a while and stuff, you know, and uh, do, do we get married? Do we not get married? If you get married? Do we have kids? Do we not have kids? If so, how many kids? Decisions after decisions, you know, that you have. And can you see him working and moving in your daily life, you know, as he, as he brings uh, about uh, all these different things that, that it's there, you know, and, 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 and tries to move you step by step, move by move, you know, to be there part of your life. When Melinda and I were first married, we got one of them you know, checkerboard blankets that you get from Cracker Barrel. You see those, you know, they got the big, you know, checkers and stuff like that. We, we had one of those and uh, I don't even know where it came from, but you know, we used to do all different games we'd play and different stuff like that. And, and when it came to checkers, you know, I'd, I'd take her out. Uh, I, you know, she'd be begging for mercy and it was just like, no. And, uh, you know, give her no more. Now there's other games that Melinda was really good at that could take me out. But when it came to checkers, you know, I thought I was this really good checker player. And then she introduced me to her cousin named John, who is actually a champion checker player. And I'm thinking, checkers how champion you know and i and like within the second move i'm begging for mercy and i thought i knew about checkers but john i mean he could see us like strategy and checkers but he could see these moves ahead and had these moves ahead and and and, and literally just you know wipe me out all the time and when it came to that and and you know in in reality when we talk about god when we talk about god being a part of our lives god knows the end of the game before the beginning even starts I mean, just think about that. God not only knows, you know, eight moves in or 80 moves or 800 or 8,000, God understands everything. You know, he sees the end before the game even starts. And so the question is, can we see him? Do we know and can we see him working and moving in our life each and every day um, as we go through our life together with him? And what I want us to do in our time together this morning is I want us to go back. We, we spent about seven weeks in the book of Acts, and I want us to go back to one of the chapters there, Acts chapter 9. And I want to look specifically at an individual there because I think there's a lot when we look at his life that we can continue to learn how we can see God working in our lives. Of course, I'm talking about Saul. 
We know him better as Paul, you know, Saul from Tarsus, who studied under this guy named Gamaliel. He was, uh, you know, schooled, and, and you know, we, today we would say, you know, like he went to places like, you know, Harvard and Oxford and, you know, got these PhDs and all of that. I mean, he was very schooled. He knew what was going on, and, and he was also, the Bible tells us he was a Pharisee, which means when it came down to it, not only you have the 10 laws, but he had 613 other laws that he worked with. And the Bible says that, it, it literally says when it came to the law, he was flawless, meaning he was a very good person. He was a very good moral person when it came to supporting the law as far as what in, in the Old Testament laws that were there that had to follow. He was very good at that. And as good as he was at being this person knowing and following the laws and supporting it, he was just as bad of a person when it came to how he believed and what he thought of Christians and how he treated him and what he wanted to do with Christians as we know. And again, as we've learned, this is the guy like in the story you read with Stephen, you know, the stoning to Stephen, he's the one that instigated it, that came there. And just because Stephen believed in Christ and taught about Christ, he had him, you know, killed. So this is the guy I want us to take a look at here, starting in Acts 9, verse 1, that says this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. First century again, they weren't called Christians at that point. They were disciples or followers or the, you know, they belonged to the way, you know, Jesus being the way. So that's what they were. And he says, give me the permission to go in to find them, to arrest them, to put them in prison, to persecute them. And, and that ver first verse says he was breathing murderous threats. And again, I'm thankful that it's hard for us to understand, but it is really hard for us to understand what that looks like in this country, in this time, in this day and age for us. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's like, you know, today it's like, we'll say, well, you know, my coworkers made fun of me because I was reading my Bible at work. They persecuted me or, you know, he or she broke up with me because I wouldn't mess around with them because I'm a Christian. You know, I was being persecuted for my faith. That's, that's kind of how we define persecution. And, and, and again, I'm not trying to belittle that in any way, shape or form, but, you know, and, and, and I'm thankful we're in a country that does not understand this kind of persecution, but the persecution that Paul was bringing upon the people in the first century around the world, there still is this type of persecution that happens today. I mean, imagine this, you, you go to work tomorrow, like I said, and it's your lunch hour, you open your favorite Bible app, you start reading, and your boss sees you reading that. And he calls the police, and the police come in and arrest you and throw you in prison for reading your Bible at work. And you don't know how long you're going to be there, but he throws you in there for doing that. Or you decide you're going to go on this short-term mission, okay, with the youth to be a sponsor, whatever. You're going to go feed the hungry. It sounds like a noble thing to do, a good thing to do, Right? But you're going to do it in the name of Jesus. So I don't know, maybe you go to a foreign country or whatever, and, and they find out that you're there in the name of Jesus, and they come and they arrest you, take your passport, throw you in prison. You have no long, I had no idea how long you're going to be there. Or you decide, you know what, I'm going to, Dave's always talking about, you know, I'm trying to plug, a, you know, small groups. You need to be involved in small groups. If you want to have biblical fellowship, you need to get yourself plugged in. I like how I put that in there. You need to get yourself plugged into a small group. It's important biblically to be a part of, of what that looks like. And so you decide I'm going to be a part of this small group. And you're going to go to this person's home and discuss the Bible, have some food and, and, and some fellowship. But the neighbors they catch on to what's going on. And so they call the local authorities and you're arrested, you're thrown in prison. They take your house from you, okay? That's the kind of stuff that they have going on at this particular point, all right? That's how much this hate is there. And, and when you hear that about this guy named Saul, you think, man, that's the last person I can ever see becoming a follower, becoming a believer, becoming a Christian, right? Somebody that has that much hatred towards Christ and God and his church, you know, I mean, you wouldn't expect him to be that. And, and we may even have people today that we may feel that way or believe that about. It's like, ah, there's no way I, I could see such and such just where they are in their life and their walk. I, I just, you know, it's hard for me to believe, you know, and we even have sayings. It's like, well, you know, if I go in there, I'm not going to go in there because what's going to fall on me? The roof. You know, well, I'm not going to go in there if they go in there because the roof will fall on me if they ever go into church. And we have those kinds of sayings because we just can't see those people coming to God. And, and the reality is a lot of the times, the cool thing is those who often appear the furthest away from God, a lot of the times 
really are a lot closer to God than we imagine. So here you have Saul, verse 3. Saul, who's this person that seems so far away, you know, persecuting, killing, and and Saul, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And this just isn't a little flashlight, flashlight going on. If, If you continue reading through the book of Acts, you get to the 26th chapter, Saul describes it. He says, the light is brighter than the sun. So, I mean, this is a flash that's got his attention and everything. Verse 4. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Okay. I mean, just seconds before he's breathing out murderous threats, or that's his attitude towards Christians. That's his belief towards Christians. And now in verse five, he starts to respect. All of a sudden it says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, he replied. I mean, literally, boom, just... Within a second, his life is changing. You ever have an event like that, good or bad, have an event like that within a second, it's just changed? When I was in high school, we used to be able to do this thing in gym called sparring. Uh, and uh, I was a junior in, in, uh, in high school, and, and one of the guys there, his name was David Plum. He was a year ahead of me, but uh, he was a golden uh, golden Glove. He competed in Golden Gloves, and he was a Golden Glove when it came to boxing. And we were sitting there one day and just talking, and Dave threw me a pair of gloves because his regularly sparring partner wasn't there and asked me if I would spar with him. And I'm like, all right. I mean, we're good friends. You know, I, I knew he wasn't going to hurt me and all that other kind of stuff. And so we put the gloves on. We got the little mouthpiece in. We're going around, we're, and I'm sparring him. And as we're going and we're doing this, and, you know, I mean, he's landing some pretty hard punches, but I'm taking them. And I couldn't believe it. And not only that, I am connecting with some pretty good punches. And I'm thinking, wow, I can't believe how good I'm doing against this golden glove boxer. I'm holding my own. And Dave then says to me, are you ready? (laughs) Ready for what? I mean, I'm already dripping with sweat. Ready for what? You know, but as a 16-year-old boy in front of, you know, these, your classmates and everything, you can't back down. And I'm like, bring it. I didn't even get the word at it out of my mouth and I'm waking up off a mat, okay? And he's like, I'm sorry, Dave, I thought you were ready. And I'm like, oh, are you like George Foreman or something? You know, boom, in an instant, here I am standing, think I'm doing good. And the next thing I know, I'm knocked out cold. And here's Paul, Saul back then. Boom, he's walking along thinking, I've got it made. I'm persecuting these Christians. And then God reveals himself through Christ in the flash of light. And here's where, you know, it's cool. Jesus says, just make this one move. And verse six, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Notice what he doesn't say to Saul. He doesn't say, look at Saul, here's the plan. I'm going to lay it out for you. You're going to get up, you're going to go into the city, and then this is going to happen. You know, you're going to, you're, you're going to find yourself, you're going to be going around the Mediterranean, planting all these little ecclesias, these little gatherings, these little churches that are going to give me praise and glory and honor. And, and in that process, you're going to have a shipwreck. You're going to get bit by snakes. You're going to have talked before kings. You're going to have to defend yourself. You're going to get flogged. You're going to get thrown in prison. You know, I mean, because if so, he would have heard those famous words, you know, Run, Forrest, run, (laughs) in his head, and he probably would have. I mean, because think about where you are. Those of you that have accepted Christ as your Savior have that gift. If God would have told you, you know, as soon as you came up out of that water, as soon as you made that confession of faith, if God would have showed you everything that's going to happen in your Christian journey up to date, do you think you would have said, let's go? I mean, people have asked Melinda and I, you know, do you think, you know, Dave, would you have done what you've done, you know? And it's like... No, I would have run, David, run. You know, I mean, four de- over the last four decades, if when, when I was 16, when I made that decision, if, if I would have known what I would have gone through to be where I stand before you today, I probably wouldn't have. And I praise God that he did not show me everything that was going on. And God says, look it, just, just take one step. I think that's why the Bible tells us this, that, that his word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. He doesn't say it's the bright headlights on the front of our car that show hundreds of feet in front of you that you can see what's coming. It's just take this one step. It's a light into the path, you know, and this is all I want you to do. You know, I mean, if, if you're sitting there walking and it's pitch dark, there's no stars, no moon, whatever. I mean, it is pit, you can't even see your hand in front of your face and you've got a little lamp at your feet. How far are you going to see? Now, some of you may have good night vision and may be able to see a couple steps out, but most of us, we're only going to be, you're not going to see see step 30. You might see step three, but you're not going to see step 30 until you take what? Step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And God says, look, just take this one step at a time. Then I'll illuminate the next 
step. Then you take another step. Just be obedient to where I'm asking you to step. And then I'll show you the next step, one step at a time. Get up and go. And he tells Paul, get up and go to the city, and I'll show you what you must do. Be obedient. And I don't know about you, but for me, this is what I found out in my own life a lot of the times, that whenever God seems most silent in my life, it's those times when I'm disobedient in my life. And I don't mean I'm being this really bad person or God's really trying to punish me. I just simply mean God's asked me to take this step, and I've chosen not to. And so I'm being disobedient, and God's like, okay, I've told you what you need to do, you know, and you haven't done it yet. So I'm not going to give you anything new in that. You still have an assignment on the table you haven't done yet. And there's so many people that say, well, why? Why won't God show me whatever? And it's like, well, God did show you here. You just haven't taken that step. You know, I mean, I don't know how God speaks to us in so many ways. You know, one of his courses through his word. And maybe you're sitting there having your quiet time and you're reading and you're studying and you're talking, you know, you're reading about forgiveness and studying on forgiveness and realize I need to forgive because I've been forgiven much. And then all of a sudden you're thinking, wow, I have this coworker or this family member or this neighbor or whatever that in this situation is I have to forgive. doesn't matter what they said. doesn't matter what they've done. God, wow, as I'm looking... The step I need to take, the one step that God wants me to take is, I have to forgive. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. And God says, well, I've shown you the step you need to take. And until you take that step, you know, and, and, and I'm not going to show you another step. I'm only going to show you one step at a time, you know. And so God says, look, I've showed you and I want you to do this step. Verse 7. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. I mean, they're catching this bright light in the sun and everything. And then it goes on. Saul got up from the ground, um, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus for three days. He was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. So here's a guy that just seconds before could physically see, and now he's physically blind. But I honestly believe that probably for the first time, he was actually more spiritually open and could spiritually see in ways that he never could see before within his life. I mean, he's the guy that later would pin the famous words, we must walk by faith and not by sight. And to be honest, when it comes to my journey, my walk, my, walk, my life with, with, with God, I know one of the, I would much rather see more clearly spiritually than I would physically. You know, God, what do you want me to do? I don't understand this next move, but, but I believe you're leading me to do this. So I want to obey and I want to make that next move. And then God does this just weird deal. Going back to my checkers analogy, if you will. You know, it's like you're playing this game of checkers with God and, and you got these, these moves that you've been making right here on this board and, and, and you're looking at that and all of a sudden God pe- picks up a checker piece over here and he moves that checker piece and you're like, what are you doing over there? We're, we're right here. This is the part we need to be focused on. What are you doing moving over there? And he brings in this other guy in verse 10 and says this. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answers. And he tells him in verse 11, go to the house on Judas of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarshish named Saul, for he is praying. And you're going to be able to hear that that Ananias is having the same game, <laughs> same game of checkers. It's like, wait a minute, I'm playing here and you're picking a piece up that I'm not sure I understand why you're picking this piece up here because we have moves enough here that we need to deal with and you're over here and I'm not sure I like this next move you're doing. Verse 13, Lord Ananias answered, I heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Am I getting this straight, God? This is the kind of game you want to play? Yeah. I'm going to ask you to make a move that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to ask you to make a move that might be a little bit painful for you, that you might have to make a sacrifice, but I'm going to ask you to do something that, you know, might not make sense to you, but believe me, it plays into the whole scheme of things because remember, I know the outcome of the game before we even start playing the game. See, uh, for me, what I found in, in my life as a leader, as a, as a husband, a, as a dad, just as a Christian, that often the difference between where I am and where God wants me to be is a painful move that I'm unwilling to make. 
you know, a painful move that I'm unwilling to make. And I think a lot of people can understand that. The difference between where we are and where God wants us to be can be, you know, a painful, a terrifying, whatever word you want to throw in there, move that we're unwilling to make. And we have to make that hard decision, you know, to be obedient. God, yeah, God's leading me to do this, and it really doesn't make sense. It, it, it's going to be difficult, but he's showing me step by step. That's how he wants me to do it, what I need to do. One of the trips I took when I was in youth ministry, we took kids to Lake City, Colorado. If you've ever been there, it's gorgeous. But we went to what's called a wilderness camp. Our base camp was at 9,500 feet. That was our base camp. And what we would do is during the day, they would take us out and do these physical activities or do these events like we'd go whitewater rafting or whatever. And then they would, uh, in the evening, bring these speakers in and there would be this spiritual tie into what you experienced throughout the day. Well, this one day they decided that they were going to go out and we were going to go rock climbing and rappelling. And, you know, a lot of stuff I can deal with. But if you know me at all, you know, one of the things about me is I think the fourth rung of a ladder as high as any human being should be off the face of the earth. Okay. And so we're at 9,500 feet and they decide to go, let's go even higher on the side of a mountain and even climb up there with this rope the size of your pinky, Dave, and have some fun. And so we're going up there and we're, we're doing this and people are climbing. It's my turn. And uh, so I start climbing, you know, and yes, I'm younger then, but I'm still horribly out of shape and I'm making it you know as I'm climbing up there and doing better than I thought I would as I got these youth that are below and adults and sponsors telling me what to do and not. but we I get up there so far and all of a sudden the cliff does this you know and it's like no <laughs> you know you you lean into the cliff you hug the mountain because if you go backwards you what fall off the mountain, you know, and, and they're yelling and screaming, trying to tell me what to do this. And I'm trying to listen and hearing, you know, all these kids yelling and screaming and do it. And so I decide to lean back and yes, I fall. And thankfully the blay line, of course, catches me. That's why I'm still here talking to you. It catches me and, and everything. And I get back to the side of the mountain and I get back to that spot and I'm frustrated. I'm irritated. I'm making mistakes. And I look down, I hear this little, Hey, and I look down and there's this like young 20 year old, something, whatever, that just straps on this line and blay and everything. And he just comes up the side of the mountain like Spider-Man, you know, and he gets just like right to my face. And, and my, here's my thought, you know, knife, phew, see ya. I mean, that's, you're not supposed to be able to do it that easy and that quick. All right. And he's there and he goes, listen, Mr. Beals, just follow me. I'm going to tell you where to put your hands and your feet. And if you do, you'll make it. Okay, we'll make it through this together. And so he starts telling me and putting my body in these twister move types of positions and everything. And we get in one position. Well, I'm, I'm actually really surprised that I'm, I'm this far out on this ledge doing this. And then it, he's got my body contorted and I got my left hand. He says, now let go of your right hand. <laughs> no, you know, I, I don't want to let go. But he says, no, trust me. And when I did, I hung there. And I was like, this is cool. And he kept telling me the rest of the way around the curve and up to the top of what we get there, we're, you know, chest bumping and all that. I I made it. I made it because I listened to this kid, this kid who knew the steps that needed to be taken, and he showed me, and because I listened and followed what he said, I was able to do something I never thought that I could do. And so many times, and, and God may say to you, look at here's what I'm calling you to do. Yeah, it could be painful. It could be scary. It could be frustrating. It might seem insignificant to you, but do it. But do it in your life. And that's in verse 15. But the Lord says to Ananias, go, this man Saul, he's my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Can you hear how frustrating this is? Think about it again. All right. Here is Saul arresting, putting in prison. People are dying for three years under Saul. Here's Ananias. Some of these people that this might have happened to may have been people that he knows that are friends. Ananias believing this man Saul, which he was coming after him. Here's God say these words. This is my what? My chosen instrument. Let that sink in. For three years, Saul has been arresting, beating, having killed Christians. And God says, this is my chosen instrument. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, that's not who God chooses to do his work, does he? I mean, that's, that's not how God works. God chooses those people that are good, that are right, that are true. You know, not someone like Saul, you know, that was on his way to have more people arrested and killed, chosen instrument. See, God works. Uh, 
God works in ways that's hard for us because we try to put on the mind of God. We fail every single time. But anybody that's willing to say, here I am, use me, God's willing to use. God will use, you know? And that's hard for us to grasp. That's why we're not God, <laughs> you know? But that's the truth is there. Most people think that God calls those who've already been prepared, but the reality is God is preparing those he's all, that's already been called. And maybe that's you, yourself, you know? Maybe that's you, yourself, and, and that he's speaking to you. And, you know, he's not looking for some superstar, as much as he's just looking for one to say, okay, yeah, I'll take that one step at a time. I can't see the next, don't understand, a little frustrated, I don't really know, but you do, God, so I'll take that one step. And a lot of times we want to be like Saul. We want to be the one, you know, that, that has, you know, well, he wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, as they say, and, and, and stuff. We, we want to have that, and really when we should probably be more obedient in the small things like Ananias. God says, you know, you've been faithful with small things. I'll trust you with bigger things. You know, so yes, yes, Ananias, Saul is my chosen vessel. doesn't make sense, but trust me. Trust me when it comes to that. And, and I love in verse 17 and 18 what it says. Then Ananias went to the house <clears throat> and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Wow, I love that. Immediately, you know, immediately he could see again. And, and, and I think so many different times in our lives, I think sometimes we can see God clearly, but sometimes then it gets a little blurry. Sometimes we think we understand, and then sometimes confusion comes in. Sometimes, you know, we, we think we hear, but then it's almost like we, we can't hear as well with that and, and everything. And those times are, like I said before, are probably times when we're not taking the step or we're the ones walking away, not God, because God is always pursuing us with his love. We're not walking away. God, God is always there for us. And when we're willing to take that one step, when we're willing to be that, obedient, then immediately God shows up in ways probably a lot of the times we could never, ever imagine. You know, we could never, ever imagine. And I don't know how many of you, you know, if you ask yourself a question, you really do have some decisions you need to make. You're just not sure what quite to do. Well, maybe that's why God brought you here to hear this today. You know, so you can say, Maybe I need, well, I, I need to find someone to talk with. Or maybe, you know, you, you, you've heard the voice, but like I said, it's, you can't hear it as clearly. Or you, you, you've seen that light, but it's a little dimmer, and God's like, hey, maybe you just get, need to get reconnected. Get reconnected. Because, you know, one thing I know is a lot of the times, like I shared last week, people say, I just don't understand what God wants. Well, simply what God wants is a yes, but not a yes, but... Or a yes, maybe. He wants a 100% yes. I want all of you. You know, I want all of you. That's what I created you for. That's why I created you. We talk about purpose here all the time. We talk about meaning. That God has a purpose and a plan for each and every person. And, and he wants us to say, yes, I'll take that step. You know, I'll take that step and I'll go where you want me to go even though I don't understand. I don't understand what that is. I don't understand what that looks like. But he wants that 100% yes, all right? Yes, that is there. And, and we're going to come before these elements here in a moment. But, you know, I wanted to share this one last thing for you because I think the toughest thing for us is understanding that, you know, having that faith to realize that God does guide, lead, and direct. And he's giving us, you know, something that we can turn to and people that we can turn to to walk with and to guide, lead, and direct us. And what I mean by that is this. Let's say, you know, you're all, while you're all been in here sitting and talking and singing the songs and laughing at my jokes and, and, and all that other kind of stuff and enjoying God's word and being blessed by it and everything. While you were in here, you didn't know, we moved all your cars down to the lake. Not that lake, but, you know, the, the park. Let me go that way. Not to the lake. We, we moved it to the park, okay? And I'm going to give every single one of you a map. And, and between here and to get to your car... We also, during this time, because we got a lot of fast-moving people, we planted about 100,000 landmines. But on the map that we give you, it will show you exactly where every single landmine is. Now, what are you going to do with the map? You know, what are you going to do with it? A lot of people say, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that later. 
I'll look at it later. I'll study it later. I'll get to know, because we have all this other stuff, whatever, you know, that's there. And I just got to get to the car because I got to do this. And you go without the map. <laughs> it ain't going to be a pretty sight, is it? You know, what's going to happen? And, and that's, that's, I think that's one of our struggles today in, in our walk, in our life, in our faith. We go out there and God says, look at, I have given you a map. I've given you a map to understand why you were created. I've given you a map to understand the purpose. I've given you a map to understand, you know, uh, these things. And, and some of it you might not understand, but yet there's a purpose behind it. And you can see I've kept my promises. I've given you this map to show you the journey of the life that you can walk. And a lot of people throw it back here and say, I, I can't, I got to go do this. And they get out there and they step on landmines and like, why is my life blowing up around me so much? And it's like, God's like, well, look at, I've shown you. Not that there won't be difficulties in that journey, but I'm there to walk with you. Not that there won't be trials, but I'm there to walk beside you, to help you at different times. Maybe I'll even carry you over a couple landmines at that time, but I am there with you. And not only am I with you, but I've given you something called the family of God that you've heard me teach and preach on so many times that is willing to do life together, to walk through life with you. So God says, I want you to say yes to being a part of this journey and committing to being a part of this journey of walking through this life, fulfilling the purpose for which I've created you. So as we come before these elements here this morning, I've given you, I realize, a lot to think about and, and stuff. And, and I want to encourage you as you come before these elements and you take the two cups and come back to your seat and you think about the love that God has for you. You think about what he's done for your son Jesus through his son Jesus for us and, and, and how he wants to be a part of our lives and how he is a part of our lives and willing to be a part and how all of those kinds of things... You know, just let his spirit speak to you, his Holy Spirit speak to you about maybe a decision you need to make, a step that maybe you've been putting off for a while. And if you want to talk to somebody about that step today, don't leave. We've got leadership here that would love to chat with you. Go in and sit down at the nacho bar there with you and, and sit and talk and continue to have a conversation about what it means, you know, to take these steps, to take them together. But let's go before him right now. Father, I thank you. I thank you again that we could come, we could celebrate, we can rejoice, Father, because of you. I thank you for what that means to each and every one of us. And I thank you for the truth that is there, that, Father God, we can when we look and we can know that, Father, you are one step at a time, one move at a time. You're directing our lives. You're willing to direct our lives. And we praise you for that. Forgive us when we forget that, Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you for just this time we can be reminded of that. And Father God, again, Uh, Thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. And as we come before these elements, Father, we do want to praise you for the gift of your son, Jesus. And Father, we ask that you just speak to our hearts. Help us to see, is there a move you've asked us to make? And Father, we haven't made it. Is there a step you want us to take and we haven't taken it? And Father God, today, may we make that move. May we take that step, Father God, so we can continue to be led and guided by you, Father. Thanks so much for the truth that we've heard today. Thanks so much that we could gather and celebrate and rejoice in your name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. Speak to my soul.
Father God, help us to be still and listen for your voice. Help us to be still and hear you when you speak to our hearts. And Lord, that we may see you through all the clutter. May our focus be on you. And take with us today what you have to say to us so that we can proclaim to the world your gospel in our words and live it with our lives every day. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 